director. I'm Richard Bentall. I'm a psychologist, and you might be wondering what psychologists have to say about uh, pandemics. And uh, I should say at the outset that I'm mindful of that um, the work I and others uh, in psychology have been doing in many ways is not nowhere near as important, of course, of, as what uh, doctors are doing in terms of and frontline NHS staff in terms of fighting the pandemic. Uh, but there is an important psychological aspect to any pandemic. Um, and uh, in fact, you can think of a pandemic as having sort of two components, really. One is the kind of biological component of the virus passing from individual to individual and creating disease. But also, um, there's the way that people respond to it and how the, uh, you know, the implications of that. So people's responses, psychological responses to a pandemic are important in three ways, mainly. So the first is that um, we're going through an unprecedented period of social and economic change. Uh, changes in the way we live and who we can relate to uh, in our social behaviour and our economy and that's bound to have an impact on the mental health of uh, ordinary people and at some point that effect may be significant enough such that some thought needs to be given to providing special interventions or services for people in uh, who are particularly badly affected so there might be a, a kind of demand for more resources at some stage for people who've been badly affected. But in many ways more important is the fact that behaviour by people during a pandemic, which might be motivated by anxiety or depression, can affect the pandemic itself. There's quite credible um, evidence, actually mainly from people doing modelling, but it's quite credible modelling, shows that um, the behaviour of people during a pandemic will affect whether a virus will pass on or not. And of course that's why we're encouraged to social distance. Um, so for example, um, in the H1N1 uh, pandemic um, in the Far East, one of the things which was found was that uh, people tend to be quite anxious at the beginning. And those who are most anxious were most people most likely to follow social distancing guidelines. Unfortunately, as time went on, uh, anxiety tended to go down, people habituated to the situation and that was accompanied by a reduction in social distancing. Um, and we may be seeing some of that at the moment. I, earlier on today, I was wandering through Sefton Park in Liverpool, and there seemed to be an awful lot of people sort of sitting around talking to each other in the sunshine. Um, so uh, psychological responses to the pandemic, how we behave may well affect uh, the spread of the virus itself. And finally, a really important thing is that uh, at some point we're going to come out of this pandemic and we're going to have to try and recover our economic activity and our social life, conventional social life and so on. And our ability to do that may well be affected by the burden of mental health in the population. So um, the psychological aspects of the pandemic are certainly not trivial and they need to be examined. And unfortunately, there's been very, very little research on this. It's a bit from the Far East, uh, but very little on populations and looking at how populations have been affected. There's studies mainly been on the effects of pandemics either on people who've become infected and recovered or on uh, uh, key workers, health workers. Uh, and in both cases actually those groups seem to be quite, you know, they, they suffer quite a degree of psychological problems it seems uh, which can be quite persistent. So um, on a positive note, it's probably worth note saying that not all the psychological impacts of a pandemic are going to be negative. Um, and there may be some ways in which uh, what's going on at the moment has um, a positive effect on those of us who don't actually contract the virus. So for example, um, for many people, just some simple examples, for many people the commute to work has been reduced dramatically. In my case, it's been reduced from two hours to about 10 seconds. Um, and for those of us who are still in work, of course, look quite a lot of people who are not in work, that might be beneficial. It may be more beneficial that we're spending more time with our families, but obviously that will depend upon the families. Um, people are developing novel ways of social networking. So one of the things we found out in the past is that the extent to which one feels like that one belongs to one's local community, or in fact belongs in any sense to any kind of group, we call this social identity. Um, protects against mental health 
So it, it confers resilience on people. So uh, people identify with their neighborhood, they identify with their nation, they identify with their ethnic group, they identify with their football team uh, or their running club or whatever. We all form these kind of groups in our heads. The more we do that, the more we are protected. Uh, so for example, in previous research, we've shown that people are more resilient to financial stress the more groups they can work on. Um, now at the moment there are there's quite a proliferation of new social networks developing. My neighbourhood, for example, we've got a uh, WhatsApp group, and I found myself talking to people I, you know, further up the road I didn't even know kind of a few months ago. So that might be a positive thing, but all these positive things, of course, will depend upon individual circumstances. So um, if you've got a good family system to start off with, you've got a family where everybody kind of relates well and gets on then spending more time together is likely to be beneficial. It'll increase the extent to which you bond. On the other hand, if you live in a dysfunctional family or one where there is abuse of some kind or where somebody, you know, when there's uh, an abusive partner or parents are abusing children, then this situation is going to make all that worse. So it's going to be new. Some people are going to get a benefit and some people are going to be quite badly harmed. So I said before that nobody really studied the mental health of whole populations in a pandemic before. So uh, with a group of colleagues at Sheffield University and at the University of Ulster, we tried to set up a, a project to do precisely that. We call ourselves the uh, um, uh, COVID-19 Psychological Research Consortium, which sounds a bit posh. Uh, we're just a bunch of people who've been interested in public mental health for a while and who just happened to be in a good place to do some research into what was happening in Britain in the pandemic here. And we're very fortunate we got a little bit of funding from Sheffield University and Ulster University, which meant we didn't have to go wait to go through the conventional funding um, channels. And actually, this is the quickest research project I've ever set up. It went from the idea emerging in a conversation around my kitchen table through ethics and funding to collecting the first data point in two weeks. Normally it would take something like six months. We collected a sample of about 2,000 people, 2,025 in fact, uh, in the week beginning March the 23rd. I wish I'd had the idea a little bit earlier because it would have been good to get the week before, but we recruited those people in that week and um, they all completed online questionnaires which were designed to measure a whole variety of things, not just mental health, but for example, political attitudes, which we'll come back to, um, and also um, uh, their knowledge about COVID and um, their, the extent to which they were uh, conforming to advice about um, social distancing and so on. So, um, we are able to do this because we work with a survey company, so it cost a bit of money. Um, people pay to do it, but we actually got a very good sample. So for example, we've checked our sample against, so we asked people, for example, about their voting record. And that's a good way in which we can check whether the sample represents the country politically, and it did very closely. Um, we also looked at the number of children and households. We looked at uh, household income. In fact, we recruited specifically to get a sample which is representative in terms of household income, also age and also uh, gender. So we think, although it's not a, what we would call a random probability sample, which would be the best way of doing it, which is basically picking people at random, it's what's called a quota sample. We specifically look for these people in these different groups. We think we've got a good, good picture. And the bottom line is that in the week of, the, of March the 23rd, uh, when we administered, uh, we used three measures which are widely used in public mental health research. One's called the, actually four measures, one's called the PHQ-9, which is a standard measure of depression. It's one which the NHS prefers. What, another's called GAD-7, which is a measure of anxiety. Um, we also have the International Trauma Questionnaire, which measures stress symptoms related to particular traumatic events. And we also had a, a, a measure which I wasn't familiar with until this, this time, actually. One of my colleagues introduced it, the GAD, the, sorry, PHQ-15, which measures what's called somatization symptoms. So these are when people become stressed and they start to produce kind of physical symptoms uh, related to stress. 
I should say as a caveat to that, it's very difficult to, you know, clearly distinguish between physical symptoms which are stress related and physical symptoms which are related to, you know, some kind of underlying illness. Anyway, what we found was that 21.6% um, of uh, the sample uh, met caseness. This is, we use the NHS's own preferred def definition of severity of depression, which might require treatment. So this is moderate to severe levels of depression. 21.6% met caseness for depression. Um, uh, sorry, that's caseness for anxiety and 22.1% met caseness for depression, but they were very much tended to be the same people. Most people, you know, if you meet caseness for one, you're likely to meet caseness for the other. Uh, and then about 17% uh, were um, expressing um, moderate or severe stress symptoms. And that's a bit above what has been found in previous studies, but it's not dramatically above. So the nearest comparable study uh, is something called the Clark Northwest Coast Household Survey, which I actually helped to design, which uh, involved interviews of 4,000 people in the Northwest. And in that, 17% were moderately or severely depressed, and 13% were anxious. So we're a bit up on that, but not dramatically. We're not getting a tsunami as yet of sort of mental or health, uh, which is good news. And, and in a way, I think that's expected because what we know from previous research is that traumas which affect whole populations tend to be less severe in terms of their psychological effects than traumas which affect only one person. If you're the person who gets assaulted, then you're more likely to develop stress symptoms than if you're in a community which is suffering under some kind of stressful circumstances. But a really important point is that everybody's kind of different. So there are some groups who are especially vulnerable and that turned up in our survey. Uh, so we found that actually people who are younger were more likely to experience anxiety and depression. Uh, not surprisingly, those with pre-existing health conditions, uh, those with pre-existing psychiatric conditions, those who are suffering from economic hardship. At that time on the 23rd of March through to the 28th of March, just over 30% reported losing income because of the pandemic. It'll be higher now. Uh, um, and also people have got small children at home. They seem to be particularly vulnerable to depression and anxiety. And I worry that they're a group which people have not thought enough about. And they may be a group which may be need um, special attention. And in addition to those, I should just mention that we know from previous studies that those who've been infected and those who work on the front line in the NHS or who are carers are also likely to be especially vulnerable to um, psych psychological difficulties as we go on. Um, so, um, of course, that's just a snapshot in the first week of lockdown. What's really interesting is whether things have changed, whether people have got more stressed out, more depressed, more anxious as time's gone on. And I'd like to be able to tell you the answer to that question. And if we were having this meeting in a week's time, I would be able to tell you that question, the answer to it. Because we have followed up um, most of the people who we recruited in that first week, and we've tested them again. So that was um, in the, um, actually just last week, but the data literally landed in my in-tray um, at about 11 o'clock this morning and um, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of cleaning it up and comparing it to with the data from the last wave so it's going to take uh, three or four days I guess before we know the results but we'll be able to see whether um, people are becoming more affected over time and we intend to do further waves of the survey uh, as we go on so long as we can get some funding we've now run out of funds but we've applied for some more um i'm kind of hopeful that we'll get them but nothing certain so that's where we are we've got a population which is mostly resilient but there are certain groups who um are particularly vulnerable and may be in difficulty as we go on the final thing i want to say i don't know how long i've been going on for but just to kind of add a final point 
some of the adverse psychological consequences of the pandemic will not be in terms of mental health. Pandemics affect people psychologically in all sorts of different ways. And there are two things which we're currently looking at and working on data at the moment uh, to try and understand. One is in terms of panic buying. Uh, it turns out that nobody has really studied panic buying. There's a little bit of work by economists, but nobody's thought about the psychology of panic buying. In the early stages of the pandemic, we did see uh, a little bit of that. Actually, worldwide, there have been quite a lot of reports of it. And there have been reports of it by historians who studied previous kind of uh, major crises, for example, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, the, the interesting thing about panic buying is that you can see it's a kind of rational behavior. And um, it's also a behavior which, like the virus itself, depends upon the behavior of other people. So um, when you go into a supermarket, you may tell yourself that you're not going to over-purchase, you're just going to you know, buy as normal. But then when you're confronted with a shelf which has only got 10 tins of tomatoes left on it, what do you do? You may not have been thinking about buying tomatoes, but you probably would buy some under those circumstances. <laughs> and um, actually a kind of literature which is helpful in terms of thinking about this is literature on foraging in animals, because animals actually employ quite subtle strategies to decide whether to continue to forage on a particular patch or move on to another patch and when to hoard, when to store food. And it's, you know, in a way it's a bit of a no brainer, but it won't surprise you to know that uh, as animals anticipate uncertainty about food stocks in the future, of course they hoard. So um, what we found is that um, there are certain demographic factors which predict over purchasing. Uh, one is having kids at home, not surprisingly. Uh, if you've got more dependents, then you're going to be more concerned about the lack of potential food stocks in the future. We also found that uh, neuroticism and anxiety um, predicted uh, overpurchasing. Oh, by the way, one of the things we found is that people tend, you know, people varied a lot in terms of the extent to which they purchase more than they would normally do. But um, if people purchase, tended to overpurchase in one particular product line, they tended to overpurchase in all of them. People in general, either people who who bought a lot and stockpiled it, or there were people who didn't bother. Um, not surprisingly, the people more neurotic and anxious tended to stockpile, as did people who are intolerant of uncertainty. This might interest you that people who are right-wing authoritarians also tended to stockpile more. Um, right-wing authoritarianism is thought to be a kind of personality trait which is related to political points of view. There's a kind of whole field of political psychology. Uh, the gist of it, I, I'm not an expert in it, but we have experts on political psychology in our project. Um, the extent to which people choose to vote one way or another or that uh, pledge their allegiance to particular parties and so on, is partly determined or seems to link to personality traits. Uh, the right-wing authoritarian person is a person who is very activated by any sense of threat and um, when they uh, respond to threat, they tend to be, um, they're more likely to respond to threat. And when they do respond to threat, they tend to uh, become more ideological, more authoritarian, and more hostile towards outgroups. And in our work, they tend to also buy more tins of stuff. Um, a particular personality, uh, it's not really a personality trait, an analytical trait, uh, an intelligence trait, which I'm interested in, is called analytical reasoning. And analytical reasoning is basically your ability to stop and think. Some people, if you just tell them something, they'll just believe it without thinking about it. But some people, if you tell them something, they'll kind of pause and have a think about it. Mm. And we can test this quite with some quite simple puzzles. Uh, so, for example, um, here's one. Um, uh, what, uh, if a pond... If pondweed doubles in the area it covers every day, and it covers the entire pond in 48 days, how long does it take to cover half the pond? Um, we probably haven't got time for you to... That's one there. Oh dear. The hey. whole pond in one, one day. 48 days. It, 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 the day before it must have covered half the pond. Uh, but about 70% of people say 24 days, because they just kind of hear a half. And that's what they think. 
they don't think about it and actually quite a few professors give the wrong answer in my experience um, so analytical reasoning is important because in this situation because it takes analytical reasoning to sort of pause and think while you stand in the supermarket and decide you know what i don't need to buy those tins of tomatoes because um uh they'll be they'll restock and i could come back in two days time and get some if i need them so we've got a kind of psychology of panic buying worked out which i you know quite interested in myself personally the other thing which we've looked at is um nationalism and attitude towards migrants so and again this goes back to right-wing authoritarianism um, it turns out that people who are right-wing authoritarians in their personality characteristics um, the more anxious they get about the virus the more nationalistic they become and the more hostile they become towards migrants now in this sense I just should let's maybe explain what nationalism is uh, political psychologists make a distinction between nationalism and patriotism. Patriotism is basically loving your country, seeing its faults and its and its and, and the good bits, and wanting to make it better. Nationalism is believing your country is exceptional and better than other countries. So people with a certain kind of right-wing disposition seem to become, as they become more anxious about the virus, they become more convinced that Britain is an exceptional nation and that other nations are not as good as us. And they also become more hostile towards migrants. Um, and looking forwards, that might not really be good news, particularly for those of us who are, you know, Europeans in our hearts and feel that Britain's place really belongs as part of the family of European nations. Um, it should be said not everybody's reacting that way it's just a certain subset of the population but maybe that's uh, something we should worry about as time goes on anyway i've no idea how long i've talked to but anyway those are my main points i wanted to cover just to summarize um you know pandemics have important psychological consequences uh, it appears that the population in britain is so far fairly resilient that there are some vulnerable groups but there are also psychological consequences other than for mental health, which might be important in the long term.